Thank you. And before I ask for oral questions, I want to acknowledge that we are met today on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, First Nations. Oral questions? The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to begin by welcoming all members to our first question period of, uh, of this Parliament and congratulate the Speaker again on his, uh, his election to his important role. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. People deserve a Premier not beholden to lobbyists and insiders and someone who tells the people of Ontario exactly what he's up to. But instead, this Premier is not even three weeks into the job, and he's already telling Ontarians one thing and doing the exact opposite behind closed doors. Why did the Premier say that the CEO of Hydro One would get zero, absolutely zero, when he knew that the CEO would walk away with millions? My question was to the Premier. Premier? Mr. Speaker, congratulations, and congratulations to the Leader of the Opposition. My, if I could remind the Leader of the Opposition when we were out campaigning that we ran clearly on getting rid of the CEO and getting rid of the board. As the news media went around and said it cost $10 million, I'm here to tell you that there was zero severance. Absolutely zero severance. We were given a clear mandate to reduce hydro rates by 12 percent, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Unlike the opposition leader, next month, if you were in charge, there'd be 7,000 people without jobs out in the Pickering Hydro facility. You were going to close hydro down, and there'd be 7,000 people wondering where they'd get their next Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Looks like this Premier is going to be as honest in this House as he was on the campaign trail. I have to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw. withdraw. The Premier said that the payout to Mayo Schmidt was zero. Absolutely zero. But now we know that Mr. Schmidt will actually walk away with incentives worth at least $9 million, maybe even more. Speaker, Will the Premier tell Ontarians exactly how much his backroom deal will end up costing Hydro One ratepayers? Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, thank you for the question. I just want to remind you that the CEO of Hydro is getting a zero severance. Zero. In 2016, 2017, and 18, under the Liberal government, with your support, you propped them up to have stock options. The stock options is what you're talking about, but I can assure you the CEO had the same benefits as any other employee with their pensions and their benefits. Again. The CEO of Hydro is gone. The board is gone. We're turning the page when it comes to hydro rates. We have the highest hydro rates in North America. We will reduce hydro rates by 12 percent. Thank you. Final supplementary. I'd like to remind the Premier of this province that the New Democrats are the only party that has firmly stood against the privatization of our electricity system. Conservative government.
government, Speaker, that started the privatization of electricity in our province when they were in government last time. Premier Wynne's $6 million man, Speaker, is now Premier Ford's $9 million man and counting, thanks to whatever secret deal the Conservatives cooked up behind closed doors. It's time for this Premier to come clean with the people of Ontario. How much does this secret deal really cost, and when will he make it public? Mr. Speaker, as I campaigned throughout the province, and you were side by side in many cases, we said very clearly to the people that gave us the mandate that we're going to reduce hydro rates by 12 percent. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're turning the page at Hydro One. We're turning the page at Hydro One, and I want to remind the public, God forbid you ever got elected, they'd be looking at the hydro rates double the cost of what they're looking at right now. Recognize the Leader of the Opposition for a second question. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. It's the job of the Premier to do more than respond to lobbyists and uh, repay backroom deals, Speaker. But since taking office, we've seen this Premier making backroom deals that are driven by what's best for lobbyists and insiders, not what's best for Ontario. Instead of helping everyday families, he's quietly delivering favours for big polluters, ticket scalpers and his social conservative friends. Why is this Premier making backroom deals that help insiders and conservative friends instead of helping the people of Ontario? Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the Leader of the Opposition, we're here for the people. We're here to reduce taxes. We're here to reduce taxes. We're going to create good paying jobs. We're going to reduce the hydro rates and get this economy going in the province of Ontario once again. We will be the engine of Ontario. We will create thousands and thousands of great paying jobs and putting money back into the taxpayer's pocket instead of the government's pocket. I know the Leader of the Opposition believes in big government. Everything should go through government. We believe in empowering the people, not empowering the government. Supplementary. When the Premier cancelled cap and trade, he was doing what is best for big polluters. Speaker. The cost of ripping up Ontario's cap and trade agreements and reimbursing companies for billions and billions of dollars in suddenly worthless credits will be massive. And the cost of inaction on climate change will hurt Ontarians today and for generations to come. Which big polluters lobbied the Premier to let them off the hook and stick families with the bill? Premier. Mr. Speaker, Leader of the Opposition, we campaigned on getting rid of the cap-and-trade carbon tax scam. And I want to remind the Leader of the Opposition we're going to save $790 million by doing that for the taxpayers of Ontario. Yeah, yeah. We're going to save $285 per family, putting again money back into the taxpayers' pocket instead of the big government's pocket. We're going to start respecting the taxpayers for the next four years. Yeah, yeah. Final well, Speaker, the question is how many billions and billions of dollars is it going to cost to cancel those contracts? Mr. McGuinty told us it was going to cost $40 million to cancel two gas plants, and it cost $1.1 billion. So we're very much looking forward to seeing what it's going to cost. Look, decision after decision is being driven by the Premier's desire to deliver for his friends and for lobbyists. The Premier made a backroom deal with Tanya Gra uh, Granick Allen, Charles McVitie, and other farmers right lobbyists to force out dated sex exit curriculum on students rather and drag Ontario back to 1998. It doesn't help students, Speaker. It doesn't help the safety of students at risk. It ignores the responsibilities that we have to teach children about consent and safety in school. Why, why, does, the, why does the Premier 
not care about queer young people and their safety? Question. Why does this Premier care more about the favours that he owes to social Conservatives than he does about keeping young people? Premier. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, to the Leader of op the Opposition, we're going to be very clear. We're going to govern for the people instead of for the government. We're going to lower taxes for the people. We're going to reduce taxes on small businesses that have been struggling, absolutely struggling. It makes us uncompetitive, the cap and trade and carbon tax. It puts a burden on the backs of the small businesses, medium and large businesses. It also puts a burden on the taxpayers of Ontario. We're going to make sure, once we get rid of the cap and trade and carbon tax, we're going to reduce gas prices by 10 cents a litre, here, here. putting more money into the taxpayer's pocket. Next question. Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Nobody voted for business, business to be conducted in secret and behind closed doors, Speaker. Nobody voted for that, and nobody voted for Ontario to be dragged backwards. But that's what this Premier is doing. On July 3rd, it was revealed that the Premier had secretly slammed the brakes on the new Special, uh, Special Investigations Unit Act. Now, this particular law, with the new oversight tools to help increase public trust and accountability, was the result of two full years of consultation and two rounds of committee hearings. But the Premier ignored all of that, Speaker, and ignored the voices of Ontarians. Who lobbied the Premier, Speaker, to quietly scrap the rules on police oversight? Premier. To the community services and, and correctional services. Minister. Minister for Community Safety, community safety and Correctional Services. The, basically, the uh, SIU is uh, a matter that, that's presently being looked at. Um, it's our understanding that, or I'm being briefed on it presently, so I don't have any actual information on that, but uh, I will report back to the House when I have uh, a response. Well, it's pretty worrisome, Speaker, that we have a minister responsible who doesn't know the file at all, enough to even give a semblance of a response to a question in the legislature. New Democrats stand with communities across Ontario in our strong support for updating the laws that govern police oversight and protect the public trust in policing. The Tulak review took over a year and involved 17 public hearings and received 1,500 submissions, including from police. The previous government's legislation took another year and involved two rounds of public hearings and submissions, including from police. It wasn't perfect, but even the head of the Police Association of Ontario says that he accepts the need for police accountability and transparency. So who lobbied the Premier, apparently not, not be known to the Minister, who lobbied the Premier to ignore Ontarians and stop these new oversight rules from coming into play? Minister of Community Safety to the Attorney General Services. Well, I thank the Leader of the Opposition. No. You need to stand up and refer to her. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, if he wishes to respond, or yes, he has to respond, or, or he has to refer it to another. Yes, minister. I will refer it to the Attorney General. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for her question and congratulate her on her victory. We pressed pause on this legislation so that we could take the time to conduct a full and thorough review of the legislation by consulting with experts, police services and the public. That is what we have done. We have pressed pause on this. We want to work with our frontline police officers to make sure that we, do, we have the right answer on this issue. The Special Investigations Unit is still in place, and so that unit, the SIU, is still doing its work, but we've pressed pause on that portion of the legislation. Next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Again, uh, 
Congratulations, Mr. Speaker, on your election. I know you'll be a truly dedicated and capable servant of this House. Mike. My question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, and I also want to congratulate the Minister on his new job. Premier Doug Ford and the Government for the People campaign on a plan for making life more affordable for families and respecting taxpayers. That starts with scrapping the uncompetitive and unaffordable cap-and-trade carbon tax. It didn't protect the environment. Instead, it only jacked up the price of gasoline, home heating, and everyday items to, like groceries and clothing. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please update the House on the Government for the People's progress scrapping this tax and tell the people of Ontario how much this will save families? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you also to the member for his tough but fair question. <laughs> I'd like to congratulate the member from Perth, uh, from Perth Wellington, um, uh, for his re-election, and I know that he is a, an expert and excellent representative of, uh, of his constituents. As the Premier has already stated today, our government is moving swiftly to scrap the Liberals' cap-and-trade carbon tax. Cabinet has already taken measures to this effect and will be introducing legislation this session to finish the job. Scrapping the Liberals' cap-and-trade carbon tax will save the average family $285 a year. And it's a first step towards our commitment to reduce gas tax by 10 cents. We received a strong mandate from the people of Ontario to scrap this ineffective tax, and we're delivering on that promise. Promises made, promises kept, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Supplementary, the member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. I'm glad to hear that the government for the people is delivering on its promise. When I went to door to door, I heard time and time again that life was harder and more unaffordable under the previous government. And I know the people of Perth Wellington will be happy to hear we are scrapping the carbon tax. <laughs> Unfortunately, other parties in this House will stop at nothing to impose another carbon tax on the people of Ontario. One member opposite has even said he will fight to impose the highest carbon tax in North America onto the people of Ontario, raising gas prices by 35 cents per litre. Could the minister please tell the people of this House what measures the government for the people is taking to protect Ontario families and job creators from future carbon taxes? Minister. Say this is the minister. Thank you for the follow-up question uh, through you, Mr. Speaker. Our government has been clear. No carbon taxes now, no carbon taxes ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The people of Ontario can't afford one. They can't afford one now, and they can't afford one in the future, so they won't have one. Our government will be introducing legislation to scrap the Liberals' cap-and-trade carbon tax once and for all. Our government will challenge any efforts from the federal government to impose a carbon tax on the people of Ontario. While the members opposite may fancy themselves as carbon tax crusaders, the government will be standing with the people. Ontario families, as I said, will save $285 a year, will lower gas taxes by 10 cents a litre, and put more money in their pockets. It's real change for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Late on Friday, the Energy Minister announced that he was ripping up 758 renewable energy contracts <laughs> signed by the provincial government. We don't know why these particular projects were chosen. The decision was made behind closed doors. We do know that many of these projects are owned by municipalities, public utilities, local farmers, school boards and First Nations. And the Premier says he will pass legislation to download the cancellation costs from the province onto these local communities. Will the Premier tell us how much cost and disruption he will force on local communities, First Nations, households and farmers as a result of his backroom decision? To the Minister of Energy. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and on my first occasion to rise in this place, I want to thank my wife and children for their love and support, and the constituents of the Great Kenora Rainy River District for electing yeah. them to this place. 
going to attempt, Mr. Speaker, to fill with humility the shoes of the great uh, Leo Bernier, the former Emperor of the North, as he was fondly uh, known from the Kenora Rainy River District. For the past couple of weeks, Mr. Speaker, there is a palpable excitement across Ontario as projects that represented wasteful spending by the previous government uh, have been cancelled. Mr. Speaker, make no mistake about it, this is not about anything more than a savings of $790 million to the tax. It, it represents the first in a number of steps that we're going to take to make sure that every Ontarian sees a savings on their energy bills moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Here, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Premier. One of the affected communities is the small northern Ontario town of Blind River in the riding of Algoma, Manitoulin. Eight years ago, the Minister of Energy the current minister applauded the town's decision to take out a massive federal loan under the federal conservative government to build a solar energy project under the Green Energy Act. The deal went bad, and the town of 3,600 is nearly $50 million in debt with nothing to show for it. Instead of helping the town recover, the minister is making things worse. Instead of making backroom decisions, forcing unknown costs onto small towns and First Nations, why won't the Premier review these contracts in a transparent process that is based on evidence and the public interest? Minister. Interesting question about Northern Ontario coming from a member from downtown Toronto, Mr. Oh. Speaker. Let me tell you, after years of working for the people across Northern Ontario, what they were talking about an expensive way of life, longer winters than most, colder than most, people making choices between heating and eating, Mr. Speaker. The goal of this and the promise of this platform and uh, Premier Ford was to reduce hydro weights, rates. That's what Northern Ontarians were focused on. That's what they told us on June 7th, and that's exactly what we're going to deliver, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. The member for Brampton South. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. I would like to start by congratulating the Minister uh, for being tasked with this important responsibility. I know that she will do great work for her constituents and the people of Ontario. I was proud to see that the government for the people wasted no time getting to work rolling up its sleeves and finding ways to ensure taxpayers are getting value for money and programs are run as effectively and efficiently as possible. This is evidenced by the government's For the People's positive changes to the OHIP Plus program, saving hard-earned tax dollars without compromising the services families depend on. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Health please update the members of this House on the government's changes to the OHIP Plus? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I, too, would like to congratulate the member from Brampton South for being elected by his constituents and for the trust that they have in him. But within days of being sworn in, our government announced our intention to fix the OHIP Plus program by focusing on drug benefits for those who do not already have prescription drug benefits. Children and youth who are not covered by private benefits would continue to receive their eligible prescriptions free. Mr. Speaker, I repeat, children and youth who are not covered by private benefits would continue to receive their prescription drug benefits free. efficient, the new system will save taxpayers money, and the new system will dedicate precious resources to those who need them the most. Most importantly, this ensures that children and youth Thank who you. still need the prescription drugs Thank you. will need them and get them when they Complimentary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Health. Thank you for those kind words. I am proud the people of Brampton South put their trust in me. I will not let them down. And thank you very much for the important update. I am glad to see that the government for the people is getting to work saving 
taxpayers' money without compromising the sa fa services families and children depend on. It's great to hear that children and youth will continue to receive the prescription drugs they need. Could the Minister of Health update the members of this House on how they are working with insurance companies to make these changes and save taxpayers money? Minister. Insurance plans can cover thousands more drugs than the 4,400 covered on OHIP Plus. Children and youth would have more access to medications than under the current program. Private insurers had previously given some, uh, the government a grace period for some medication, which was set to expire on July 1st, and that's why we needed to move quickly. We asked those insurance groups to extend that grace period, which they have kindly agreed to do. And I'm proud to say that the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Associations welcomed these changes to OHIP Plus and extended the transition period beyond July 1st. We are currently working with the Insurance Association to make sure that the transition period is seamless and that young people who need the drugs will be able to get them free of charge. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. The member Kit Martin. Bonjour. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, to the Premier. Uh, why did the government drop reconciliation from uh, the mandate of the Ministry of uh, Indigenous Affairs? Uh, and what is behind the decision to have the Minister share his time between Northern Affairs, Mining, Energy and Indigenous Affairs. Premier, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and miigwech uh, to the member. I congratulate him on winning a region of northwestern Ontario that's near and dear to my heart, as I had served it in my former capacity as the Member of Parliament for the Great Kenora Riding and spent several years there working as a nurse and a lawyer uh, in those communities. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. We ran a campaign that reflected the needs for all Ontarians, and we appreciate that Truth and Reconciliation represents a dark chapter in Canada's history. Moving forward, Mr. Speaker, we intend as a government to honour the principles of Truth and Reconciliation, but focus, Mr. Speaker, on the things that Indigenous communities are asking for, a piece of the prosperity that all Ontarians have come to expect in their communities. And moving forward, whether it's resource revenue sharing, Mr. Speaker, for municipalities and Indigenous communities in this province, but particularly in Northern Ontario, we're going to make sure that those Indigenous communities have access to the kind of prosperity that we all expect from a government. Supplementary question. Thank you uh, again, uh, Saul Mamakwa from uh, Kiwetnuk uh, Riding. Uh, speaker, uh, First Nations are uh, concerned about the government's step uh, backward away from reconciliation. Nishinaabaski Nation uh, Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler said, it is difficult to see how progress can continue to be made when First Nations are reduced to only uh, on how they relate to the government's ability to access the resources within our lands. During the campaign, the, the Premier famously said he would get on a bulldozer himself to get the ring of fire underway. And he also said that he would stop talking and start doing. But from the, from the perspective of First Nations, uh, the only way you can start doing anything in uh, their territories and our territories is to start talking to our territories. Speaker, how does the Premier propose to do this with a part-time minister? Thank you. <laughs> minister? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I can assure the member opposite that there's nothing part-time about the devotion and the skill that I bring to this portfolio. This ministry stands, this ministry stands alone with a minister who has spent more than eight years of his life living and working in Indigenous communities, mostly in northwestern Ontario, but in fact across Canada, Mr. Speaker. I have a keen sense and great relationships with Indigenous leaders. Some of these folks are some of my closest friends across the region, Mr. Speaker. We're going to ensure that First Nations have prosperity. The member mentioned Ring of Fire. Those communities are doing more than just talking. They're working with the private sector, Mr. Speaker. 
creating economic opportunities and creating jobs for those isolated and remote communities. It's high time, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to deliver on those promises for prosperity for Indigenous communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members. Please take your seats. Recognize the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Congratulations on your election. And my question is for the Premier. Premier, congratulations on your election and your government's mandate. And congratulations to all the members of this legislature on your election. Our caucus looks forward to working with all of you in the best interests of Ontario families. Premier, during the campaign, we heard nothing about a plan from the Conservative Party for climate change. Do you believe that it's important for your government to have a plan for climate change? Yes or no? Premier. Minister of Environment. Minister of the Environment, Conservation. So, so Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for the question. Uh, our priority is, of course, to return return our economy to the vibrance that it once had. But we absolutely understand that climate change is real, and we understand that man has played a role in that. And so we will also be bringing forward a plan to make sure that the Ontario economy is, is, uh, is vibrant and is, is strong, but also understands the impacts uh, of, uh, of our own impact as, as, as human beings on climate. That plan will not include a regressive carbon tax. Sure. Thank you for your response. Uh, Premier, if the environment and climate change were important to you, it would have been in your throne speech. Climate change is the challenge of our generation. It's what we need to do for our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids. And it is possible for a Conservative to have a plan for an environmental challenge. In the 80s, there was one Conservative Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney, and he teamed with another Conservative you may know, Ronald Reagan on their environmental challenge of the time. Acid rain. They worked together. They understood. They had a plan. Premier, I want to ask you, what is your plan for climate change? You can't just tear something down and not put something in its place. There is not an option not to do anything. Premier, what is your plan? Thank you. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you, we appreciate the member's confidence in, uh, in previous Conservative administrations. This government will, will bring forward a plan, a plan that, that understands the importance of climate change, but we will do so in a way that preserves the economic growth that's required, that, that understands that a regressive tax on individuals. That, that telling people that they can't drive their cars anymore is not an effective or a sincere way to approach this issue, but a plan will be coming. Here, here. The member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the honourable member on his re-election and his new role. I know that he'll do a fantastic job in putting our economy and businesses first and ensuring that good jobs are created all across our province. Minister, we know that our jobs across Ontario that, de that depend on trade and our American friends and neighbours. Mr. Speaker, from the steel workers in Hamilton and in Sault Ste. Marie to our world-class auto sector, so many industries and so many of our communities depend on trade with our American partners. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us some of the steps he's taking to protect those jobs and to stand shoulder to shoulder with hardworking Ontarians all across this province? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation. Well, uh, congratulations, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations uh, to uh, the honourable member. And thank you for the question. I know you'll, you'll do a great job for the uh, people of Glencott, Prescott, Russell. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is open for business once again. Here, here. Yeah. And Premier Ford, in one of his first uh, acts as Premier, actually Premier-elect, uh, 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 indicated that we will stand shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with our uh, federal cousins, cousins uh, 
on the trade issue. <laughs> I better cl clarify that for a minute. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, one of the first uh, things that he did and I did was get briefed by the federal government and the Canadian ambassador uh, on the NAFTA negotiations. Uh, one in five jobs in Ontario, in Ontario or 1.3 million jobs in Ontario uh, depend on good relations with the United States and our trade relations. And in the United States, and we want to go down there this week and make it clear that 9 million jobs depend on a good NAFTA negotiation in the United States. And that's what I'll be doing at the end of the week. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Minister, over the past 15 years, Ontario's economy has struggled under the weight of punishing red tape, skyrocketing hydro rates and unfair taxes that have put our province at a competitive disadvantage. Under the last government, there was a steady flow of both jobs and investment out of our province. Minister, I'm sure that you and your ministry have been hard at work taking early steps to not only keep good jobs in Ontario, but to attract more investment and job creation. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how his government for the people is ensuring that Ontario is once again open for business? Minister. Well, as I said, uh, uh, thank you. As I said, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, at the uh, end of this week, I'll be heading to the United States to appear, appear before a Commerce Committee. It's unprecedented that Ontario, as a subnational government, uh, has this opportunity, and we're going to make it clear we're open for business. And the way we're open for business is to keep that border open between the United States and, uh, and Ontario and Canada. 85% of our cars, for example, go to the United States. An auto park for example, could go across the NAFTA region borders seven times before it's finally put into a car, either on the U.S. side or the Canadian side. If we don't get this trade relationship right, some 900,000 cars might not be made in the next three years in Ontario. Right now, we make two million a year. That will be thousands and thousands of families who can't put food on the table. So we're counting on good relations with the U.S. Premier Ford has already set that in motion. Thank you. He's working on with the, with the governors, and we're going to open those borders. Good job. Thank you. Please take your seats. Member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations, and nice to see you in the chair. And my question is for the Premier. Collapsing the Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration into an afterthought in the middle of a global refugee crisis is wrong. Although the ministry has been erased, the issues have not. Ignoring the fact that most asylum seekers and newcomers are not breaking any laws, this government has continued to use divisive and inflammatory language. Calling those who seek refuge or asylum illegals is appalling, and it doesn't absolve this government of responsibility. This government's rash decision to cut provincial refugee resettlement services forces our cities to shoulder the cost of housing and leads to greater costs down the road. Neglecting this humanitarian crisis is not in line with Ontario's values, and it puts the $11 million from the federal government in question. Conflicting reports leave many wondering who this government is working for, what the plan is. So let me ask the Premier clearly, who are you working for and are you walking away from $11 million? Thank you. So the Premier. Premier, thank you very much for the question and a welcome back to the House and as well to you, Speaker. Uh, it's great to see you in that chair. Um, I'd also like to thank the people of Nepean for once again for a fifth time sending me to this legislature. It's the most diverse riding inside the city of Ottawa where people from all around the world come, live, raise a family and retire. I'm also proud to be an Ontarian and I'm proud to be a Canadian. And I'm proud to be, I'm proud to be a member of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party where we, for the first time, elected two Tamil MPs, Logan Kanapathy and Vijay Fang Silliam. We elected the first Korean MPP in Raymond Cho, the first Coptic Egyptian Canadian MP, Sharif Sabi, and the two Persian Canadian MPPs, Goldie Gamari and Michael Parsa, and many, many more speakers. I'll talk about the broken immigration system by the Liberal Party of Canada in the supplementary. Thank you. Please take your seats. Please take your seats. Supplementary, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Premier. 
Report after report shows that across Ontario there is a growing and long-standing housing crisis. And instead of fixing the crisis, this government has chosen to fearmonger and place the blame on people seeking asylum. But let me be clear to this premier: the premier is making things worse. Speaker, just days before being elected, Mr. Ford had a backroom conversation with Mayor Tory and Councillor John Campbell, urging them to stop the city from building a temporary homeless shelter two kilometres from his house. This homeless shelter could have provided much-needed temporary housing aid for asylum seekers. So does this Premier think it's appropriate for the Premier of Ontario to intervene in municipal plans for personal gain? Minister. We've been perfectly clear, Speaker, that the federal government has an obligation to pay for its failed federal policies. This is a situation where we have 800 people in college dormitories on August the 9th that need to be vacated so students can go back into those locations. I asked the member opposite, where does she think they should go? We have a $175 million crisis in order to pay for Toronto housing costs, which are $75 million, Ottawa City's shelter costs, which are $11 million, and in my own department, $90 million on the welfare roll. So we're going to continue to welcome people to Ontario, and we're going to continue to support them. We we, we brought in 36,000 refugees in the last two years alone outside of the Syrian refugee crisis. But somebody's going to have to pay for all of that, and it's going to be the federal government. We'd love your support in the Ontario PC Party to talk to the federal Liberals. Thank you. Please take your seat. Please take your seat. Next question, the member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. I congratulate the member from Kenora Rainy River on his appointment in this important role. I know he'll make the people of the great riding of Kenora Rainy River proud. The legacy of the previous government was the mess they made in the hydro system. Ontario was home to some of the highest hydro rates in North America. When I went door to door in Durham during the election campaign, I heard from families that had to choose between putting food on the table and paying their hydro bills. Families should not be forced to choose between heating and eating. I heard from small businesses who were forced to close their doors and shutter their windows because of skyrocketing rates. Meanwhile, insiders and friends of the previous government got rich and lined their pockets. This is a mess Question. that started with the Green Energy Act passed by both the Liberals and the NDP, yeah, yeah. and this is a mess that needs to be cleaned up. Could the Minister of Energy please tell me what the government for the people has done? And Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to congratulate the member from Durham on her outstanding victory and her representation she'll bring to her constituents. There's no question, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, Liberal, the previous government made it their mission to expand renewable energy at unsustainable rates and unaffordable contracts, industrial wind turbines and solar power, Mr. Speaker, that constituencies, communities uh, found unfavorable for them. Mr. Speaker, we're cancelling them because, imagine this, Mr. Speaker, and this will be a new kind of concept for the NDP, they certainly unknown to the other one. We're going to protect the interests of Ontario taxpayers, Ontario people, Mr. Speaker. That shareholder called the Ontario ratepayer, who owns 47.5 per cent of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. So, over the past couple of weeks, we've had a lot of excitement and activity. Thank you. We're going to reduce those hydro rates. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Thank you very much for that update. I'm glad to see the government for the people is moving swiftly to clean up the hydro mess. This is yet another promise made and yet another promise kept. Yeah. But cleaning up the hydro mess will not be easy. Nowhere is there more evident than at Hydro One. After 15 years of Liberal scandals, waste and mismanagement, the people of Ontario have lost trust in Hydro One. I heard it every single day when I went door to door in Durham. 
The government for the people will need to move swiftly and act fast. Could the Minister of Energy please Question. provide the members of this House with an update on what is being done to restore public confidence in Hydro One? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the tremendous leadership shown by Premier Ford, Mr. Speaker. We, we took uh, an opportunity to renew the leadership of Hydro One, and we're taking important steps in the coming weeks and months to ensure that the Ontario ratepayer, the Ontario taxpayer colleagues, is going to be protected. And this, including another, a couple of other important steps with my colleagues here today, are going to ensure that hydro rates come down, Mr. Speaker. The renewal of the leadership at Hydro One is going to represent a cost savings, but that's not enough for us, Mr. Speaker. We want to cancel contracts that put an unfair burden on ratepayers here in Ontario and ensure that moving forward, we're not subsidizing and punting that debt down the road to our families. We're cutting it now so families have real savings on their hydro. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government's dangerous decision to repeal the updated sexual health curriculum is dragging Ontario backwards. It is a harmful decision that puts children and youth at risk. Speaker, the people of Ontario understand that this was a backroom decision to appease a small circle of socially conservative insiders at the expense of our children's safety. Will the Premier admit that repealing the sex ed curriculum was was about advancing his own political career without any regard for the health and safety and well-being of young people in this province. Premier. To the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker, and again, it's great to see you in that chair. And as I stand for the first time in the 42nd Parliament, I want to thank the residents and the voters of Huron Bruce. not going to change. And in that spirit, Speaker, I would like to share with you today that contrary to what was reported last week, we are going to stand firmly in support of students and the realities they face in 2018. We know they need to learn about consent. We know they need to learn about cyber safety. We know they need to learn about gender identity and appreciation. But we also know that the former Liberal government's consultation process was completely flawed, yes, and that's where we're going to focus in and we're going Thank to you. respect parents and allow them a chance to once and for all have their voices heard in a very fulsome, thoughtful, inclusive consultation. Supplementary question. Please take it. Members, please take your seats. Member for London West, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The repeal of the 2015 curriculum requires schools to teach an outdated sex ed curriculum from 1998, a curriculum written before same-sex marriage was legal, before texting and Google and social media. It denies the existence of LGBTQ youth and families and the reality of our modern, diverse society. It does nothing to provide young people with the accurate, up-to-date information they need to protect themselves about cyberbullying, about sexting, about healthy relationships, most of all about consent. Why does the government want to take away the critical information and tools young people need to keep themselves safe? Minister, please take your seat. Please take your seat, Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. As I said before, contrary to all the spinning and what was reported last week, we, the Premier, myself, and our entire colleagues in the PC government, stand with students and the fact that they need. Yeah. To includes consent. That includes texting, sexting. That includes even new elements like luring, catfishing. And we need to take a look at that and open up a consultation to make sure that every person who wants to share their perspective has an opportunity to do so. And I am committed to a consultation that will absolutely ring true across this province and stamp out any misconceptions that this opposition party is trying to perpetuate and will improve upon what the Liberal curriculum has done in the past. Thank you very much. Next question. Please 
take your seats. Please take your seats. Next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. I'd like to congratulate the honourable member on his being named minister and the excellent work he is doing to make life more affordable for everyone in, the, in Ontario. Speaker, the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station is vital to Durham Region. 4,500 jobs in the region depend on the continued operation of this plant. An additional 3,000 jobs across the province also depend on the continued operation of the plant. That's 7,500 good-paying jobs, Speaker, across the province. However, throughout the election campaign, the future of this plant, plant was under constant threat. Radical special interests in downtown Toronto and opposition parties tried to shut this plant down in August and put 4,500 Durham Region families out of work. Speaker, could the Minister of Energy please tell the members of this House what action this government is taking to protect 4,500 jobs in Durham Thank Region you. and 7,500 jobs? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to congratulate the member from Whitby on his re-election. I appreciate his contributions and outstanding service to this place. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud that Premier Ford was able to uh, join the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, the President of the Treasury Board, the member from Whitby and the member from Durham to stand up. Now, here's another, here's another concept the opposition is going to get, uh, have to get used to, to promise made, promise delivered, Mr. Speaker. The Premier, the Premier Ford stood proudly with those workers, Mr. Speaker, who were concerned about what they, they could do to provide for their families moving forward if this facility was shut down, Mr. Speaker, by an NDP government. Imagine that, Mr. Speaker. We're going to move forward on an effective plan Thank that you. offers safe and efficient delivery of hydro energy, Mr. Speaker, and that's the promise we made, and that's what we're going to do. Supplementary. Uh, back uh, to the Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Minister, for this great news for the people of Whitby and Durham Region. Speaker, keeping the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station open not only protects thousands of good-paying jobs across the province, it's also great news. For Ontario ratepayers, families, small businesses, and Ontario job creators who will save hundreds of millions of dollars in their hydro bills. Speaker, unfortunately, radical special interests in downtown Toronto and opposition parties in this House wanted to shut this plant down and jack hydro bills up, making life harder and more unaffordable. Could the minister please tell the members of this House how much the government, for the people, expects keeping the Pickering Nuclear Generation Station open will save Ontario Hydro ratepayers. Well, I, I, pre, I appreciate the member uh, speaking out for another important principle that will guide this government's decision-making, Mr. Speaker, making responsible decisions yeah, yeah. that save taxpayers money. Imagine that, Mr. Speaker. Premier Ford. As government commitment to uh, govern for the, the people and keep the Pickering uh, generating station open until 2024 will in fact save Ontario ratepayers $600 million, Mr. Speaker. It will, it will ensure that 60 per cent of our electricity that comes from nuclear power will include this important asset. And as importantly, Mr. Speaker, it will ensure that 60,000 people in Ontario will have work in nuclear power. Now, this represents a wide Thank range you. of skill set people that we want working in our province, Mr. Good Speaker. And what does the NDP want to do? They want to shut it down. We'll take no lessons from much. that party when it comes to the back. Thank you. Thank you. Please take your seats. Please take your seats. Recognize the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et toutes mes félicitations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier's decision to prioritize OHIP Plus will not fix the gap in drug coverage. It will not help the millions of people who can't afford their prescription, and it will not lower the cost of prescription drugs. Instead, it is a huge step backwards from the universal public pharmacare program that family needs. How can the Premier defend his decision to privatize pharmacare when it will leave the people of Ontario with higher drug costs 
and lower drug coverage. Premier. The Minister of Health. Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Um, that is not what's happening. What we're trying to do is use the very limited resources that we have in Ontario right now for the people that actually need it, for the people that don't already have prescription drug benefits. That's what we need to do. That's what we're working with the insurers to do, and that's what the people of Ontario want. Supplementary. The minister seems to be ignoring the facts. The decisions to privatize pharmacare is not fiscally responsible. Economists and healthcare leaders all say privatizing pharmacare is the absolute wrong thing to do. In fact, the leading economist on pharmaceutical costs in Canada, Dr. Stephen Morgan, says the Premier's drug plan costs will hit the middle class the hardest. He says this cut, and I quote, benefit narrow interests at the expense of the majority of Ontario's businesses and households. So my question to the minister is simple. Which backroom insiders and lobbyists are telling the premier to privatize pharmacare, and why is the premier listening to them? Minister. People pay insurance premiums. In fact, what is happening is a common sense solution, and what we're doing is reversing a decision that was made by the previous government that made no sense to anybody at all. No what we want to do is Where there's access to more drugs than currently exist so that people can get access to those prescriptions. So right now there are situations under the previous OHIP Plus, which we're changing, where people couldn't get access to the That's medications right. they right. needed because the formulary was so old. Sure. So we need sure to move forward. We need to make sure that the insurers continue to cover as a first line so that the money will be available for the people that need it that do not have prescription yeah. drugs. Thank you. Please take your seats. Next question. Member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, uh, thank you. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Firstly, I want to congratulate the honourable member on his re-election and on the important role he has taken in our new government. Mr. Speaker, last week, many residents of Tomogamy faced the scare of their life when a mandatory evacuation order was placed on them due to the intensity of active wildfires in the region. At the height of the blaze, over 70 fires were burning and over 600 brave firefighters were putting their lives on the line to bring these fires under control. Can the minister please tell the House what steps his ministry has taken to ensure support for first responders and the safety of the local residents? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, I'd like to thank the member from Sault Ste. Marie on that question, and welcome back to our caucus, Great and I look member. forward to continuing Great working member. with you as we go forward. Yeah. Speaker, I'd first of all like to thank all the firefighters and their families from across the province and across this country who has answered the call to help those in Tomogamy. Our wildland fire and emergency response personnel, they're working closely with the Ontario Provincial Police, local authorities and agencies to fight the fire near the town of Tomogamy and to make sure that people are moved to safety. People and communities threatened by this fire are responding in a calm and orderly way, and I want to thank them for supporting their neighbours, incorporating with local officials during this emergency. Their continued cooperation with emergency personnel will help keep people safe in areas affected by the wildfires. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your answer. The intensity of these fires has required a tremendous amount of effort from first responders all across Ontario. I understand, in fact, that we have asked for and received support from other provinces as well. It takes an incredible coordination of efforts between first responders, fire rangers, support staff and teams from other provinces to respond in such a timely fashion to help execute, execute an evacuation in this period of time without injury. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please provide this House with more details on the responses and the actions taken to battle these fires in order to keep the residents of Tomogamy safe? Thank you. Minister. Thank you again for that uh, question. And, uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, we have requested and received support from uh, provinces from across the country. And, and on sure. behalf of Premier Ford and the Ontario government, we want to thank those premiers from these provinces for helping Ontario in our time of need by sending aircraft and fire rangers to help fight these fires in a significant other, 
other active fires throughout the province. I also want to thank the tremendous effort of our fire rangers and support staff who have been working tirelessly to protect this community. For the sons and daughters and partners of these first responders, I want to give them my full promise that we will do everything and give them full support in battling these fires in Tomogamy and across Northern Ontario to ensure their safety. And I want to give personal thanks to each and every one of them. I would also like to assure the House that our government is continuing to monitor the situation closely and will Thank continue you. to provide updates on a timely basis. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I have a tough but fair question for the Premier. Uh, one of the first actions your government took was a hiring and wage freeze on the broader public sector. What you don't seem to understand is when you freeze the public sector and, and, and prevent people from working for the people of this province, you shut out the public services for those people. The hiring freeze was followed by a firing of a string of high-profile senior bureaucrats, Ontario's first chief scientist. We don't know what the Premier has against facts. Ontario Trade Representative in Washington, D.C. The list goes on. Already we see a pattern with your new government. Get rid of anyone who might be critical of your agenda. Did the Premier impose a hiring freeze and fire senior civil servants so that you could replace them with your own bureaucrats who will tow the Conservative Party line? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Premier. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the question and uh, the member opposite. I also would like to thank my family who supported me in my election. and the great people of the riding of Pickering Uxbridge. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to improving the efficiency and effectiveness of government, here, here. spending in all sectors and bringing a balanced budget to the people, for the people. A public service hiring freeze is the first step towards a balanced budget and bringing real change to the province of Ontario. To that end, one of our first acts has been to direct all ministries to implement a hiring freeze until we can get a true look at the picture of the state of Ontario's finances. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. The hiring freeze does not apply to our frontline workers like nurses and teachers. The freeze will be implemented in a manner that ensures the government remains able to deliver the high-quality public services the people of Ontario depend on. Here, here. Thank you. That concludes the time we have for oral questions today, but I'd like to remind all members that when you're speaking in the House, when you have the floor of the House, when you've been recognized by the Speaker, you address your comments through the Speaker, and you, if you're speaking of other members, you speak about them respectfully, and you speak about them in the third person. Point of order, the member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce Ferg Devins, Chair of Bladder Cancer Canada, and a survivor and a proud resident of Kenora in Northern Ontario, who's in the Members' Gallery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Welcome. And Minister of Education on a point of order. Thank you so much, Speaker. I would like to share an appreciation to all of our pages. Welcome back, and thank you for helping us out during the summer session. Thank you. And I, too, would like to express my thanks to the staff of the Ontario Legislature for all the work that they've done to prepare for this special summer sitting at the House. They've worked very, very hard, and they deserve our appreciation. Table staff, as well as all the staff who work for the legislature. Thank you very much. There being no deferred votes, this House is in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.